flap, pustule, jowls, nugget, gurgle, smear, bulbous, pork. If you hear certain words on the job site, baloney, work can be uncomfortable. Tender. So at least get work gear that's comfortable. Timberland Pro work shirts, pants, and boots. Head to toe, Timberland Pro. Not uncomfortable. Moist. Welcome into NFL Live. It is Mock Draft 2.0 release day. Tim House back, the Hall of Famer Bill Polian with us. The biggest news of the day takes us to the best city in the world. The Dolphins announced last night that they intend to use the franchise tag on wideout Jarvis Landry, which will pay him just over $16 million for 2018 should he play under the tag. Landry's 400 catches are the most by a player in his first four seasons in NFL history. Jarvis Landry has been quite productive operating out of the slot since entering the NFL in 2014, landing the NFL, or excuse me, leading the NFL in catches and receiving yards when lined up as the slot guy. All of his catches are short and sweet, and Landry certainly isn't a huge downfield threat. His averaging target depth is the third shortest among wideouts since his 2014 rookie campaign. So why, Bill, put the tag on him so soon? Number one, they use the non-exclusive tag, which means that if someone gives them an offer sheet and the Dolphins don't match, the Dolphins will get two number ones in return. That won't happen. But what the Dolphins have done is hang out a for sale sign uh, on uh, Jarvis Landry's locker, inviting clubs to make them an offer. And if they get an offer that they deem appropriate, and it doesn't have to be two number ones, the two teams can negotiate compensation. Uh, and, and that team is willing to sign Jarvis to a long-term contract, then there's a deal to be made. If, if not, they keep him because he's a very good player. doesn't matter that he plays in the slot. Uh, he's nonetheless uh, an outstanding receiver, and uh, they got themselves a good player. So they're in a no-lose situation. You know, Bill makes a really good point about it doesn't matter that he plays in the slot. The reality is is you want guys that can make plays when they have the ball in their hands. And it's really the coach's job, whether you're somebody that plays outside or plays somebody that plays inside, to find ways to get you the ball. His run after the catch is phenomenal. He maybe isn't the, the typical outside dominate you wide receiver, but he wins inside and he's productive. The volume of catches and touches that he gets, um, you know, I think that body of work speaks for itself. And so it makes sense from Miami's perspective in terms of identifying somebody that has a lot of talent. And it doesn't matter what his average per uh, his contact point is, how long the pass is. It's what he does after he's got the ball in his hands. His yards per catch are, are, are pretty impressive. As the game continues to evolve a little bit, can you give a slot guy number one money and more specifically the kind of number one money that he's going to be looking for? Why not if he's your number one receiver? Yeah. Yeah, think? and I think, yeah, look look at how the game is changing quite a bit in terms of the ball getting spit out quickly. I mean, we showed a lot of these. We, we saw a touch pass to Jarvis Landry. We saw throws at the line of scrimmage. The, the game is changing with some of the, the RPO stuff, some of the just spread game concepts that we're seeing more and more of. And then his run after the catch is so good. I think oftentimes they treat him like a running back. A little bit, hey, Lavernius Coles, for example, you know, somebody like that, get the ball in a guy's hands to let him go be exciting with it um, and you know Bill made a point before the show we were talking about him it, if you can get open and catch the football you're a good receiver right I mean Amen. It, it, so so whether you're getting open outside the numbers or inside the numbers shouldn't matter you're the quarterback as he's trying to get you the ball plus he's a big body in there most slot receivers are slight he's a big body in there he can take those hits and run after the catch and he's extremely productive he's their best receiver so pay him they can't let him walk right well, I think they let him walk if they get the right deal. Yeah. But they put themselves in, they put themselves in position to retain him if that's uh, if that's in their best interest. Welcome back to NFL Live. Mel Kuyper Jr. has joined the crew with his latest mock draft version 2.0 coming your way. So we'll we'll take a look at what you have sort of in the mix here as we go. So so he goes with the with the new one here. 
Wyoming's Josh Allen leading things off with the Browns taking him at number one overall. Cleveland has drafted a league high four quarterbacks in the first round since returning to the NFL in 1999. Not necessarily a good sign there. Next up is Sam Darnold who Mel has going fifth overall to Denver. The Broncos quarterback struggled last season, logging 22 picks and a collective QBR of 32, both among the worst in the NFL. One pick after that, it's Heisman Trophy winner Baker Mayfield heading to the Jets. The last time Gang Green drafted a quarterback in the first round, it was Mark Sanchez back in 2009. And an interesting twist here as Mel has UCLA product Josh Rosen taking his talents to South Beach and getting picked 11th overall to the Miami Dolphins. So there you go. Some difference of opinion where Mel and Todd see the top four quarterbacks going. Mel has Josh Allen number one to Cleveland while Todd has Sam Darnold at the top spot and Allen going sixth to the Jets. The biggest difference is Josh Rosen. Mel has him sliding to 11th overall to Miami where Todd believes he is heading to New York with the second pick. Todd McShay will join us to talk quarterbacks here in just a minute. But Mel, let's start with the 0-16 Browns why is Allen the way to go? Well, I think you think about the division check. You think about Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and Baltimore and Cleveland as well where you'd be playing. Weather conditions not favorable there. Coming out of Laramie, Wyoming for Josh Allen, a plus. He was a quarterback that finished strong, coming back from the shoulder injury, played well in their bowl game. Senior bowl week got better, had a good third quarter in that game. Second quarter even in that senior bowl game showcased that athleticism and that mobility. So I think for the Cleveland Browns, what fits them best at this stage of the evaluation process, I think right, right now will be Josh Allen. And you come back at four, you can get the safety make of Fitzpatrick. So you have two early picks. You can get creative there and maybe take Barkley one and maybe get the quarterback at four. But if they do stay at one, right now we get down to Josh Allen or Sam Darnold. For right now, I'm going to go with Josh Allen. Okay, well, then welcome in Todd McShay and get his take on Josh Allen. Do you agree with what you just heard there? Not really, but, you know, we got a lot, a lot of time between now and the draft. I, I think it's a risky pick. I think you're you're betting on the potential, and you're betting on your ability to, to coach him and try to improve the most important part of the game for the quarterback position tangibly on the field, and that's accuracy, and that's where he has struggled. You were going to hear over and over again, only 56% uh, percent in terms of his completion percentage. Yes, there were tight windows. Yes, his receivers dropped a lot of balls. You can excuse away some of it, but... From a natural accuracy standpoint, Josh Allen is not quite there. But he does have the big arm, the big frame. He's mobile, and he can make a lot of throws that no one else in this draft, and really going back to the last five, seven drafts, none of, none of the quarterbacks who have been drafted at top, atop the board can throw the ball like this young man. So you're betting on your ability to refine him in terms of his overall accuracy. So, Mel, the, the Broncos struggled with turnovers last year. Darnold had 22 of those in 2017. If you're a GM, does that concern you? That was the issue. I think you look at Sam Darnold from two years ago to this year, there was a regression. Now, he did lose some offensive linemen and his two top wide receivers, but there were a lot of unforced errors. When we talk about how we can nitpick and how you can have red flags, all these quarterbacks have some. And for Sam Darnold, he got in some bad habits, held the ball like a loaf of bread in the pocket where he resulted in some turnovers, missing some open receivers, uh, throwing some picks, uh, making some bad reads. So he didn't have the year expected, no question about it, when he played in the Crosstown I guess UCLA and Josh Rosen. Rosen outplayed Darnold. So I think if you look at Sam Darnold for Cleveland, Denver, if you flip-flop those two, think keep in mind, John Elway was on the sidelines for Josh Allen's bowl game. He was there at the Senior Bowl as well with the Bronco coaches working with uh, Josh Allen and Baker Mayfield. So these quarterbacks, I would say they're interchangeable, but I think you can maneuver them around to fit the needs of these, these teams that need quarterbacks. And I think the, the way they come off the board may be different. Todd has a different opinion right now than I do. And this is current. Keep in mind, this will change after the combine and pro days. But for right now, Sam Darnold, I think uh, either one or five. Todd, a different opinion we just heard. What is that? Yeah, I, you know, I agree with a lot of what Mel was talking about. He did not have the year that Sam Darnold was expected to have. But I, I think his issues can be fixed. And his biggest issue is ball security. He's got to learn to protect the football with two hands inside the pocket. And that's something you can fix. It's a lot easier than trying to improve his overall accuracy, which I think is a strength of, of Sam Darnold's and his ability to extend plays and create. Plus, I just... I trust him with his leadership and his approach to the game more than the other top quarterbacks we're talking about. So to me, Darnold should be the first quarterback off the board. Mel has it going a different way. We'll see how it all shakes out. 
Baker Mayfield may be one of the more mm -hmm. polarizing figures in this whole picture once it comes together. What attributes do you like that he has that translate to the pro? You know, you think about a guy who's a gamer, right? He loves the game. He's passionate about the game. He's a leader. He galvanizes. The teammates will go through a wall for him. Uh, yeah, you know, he won big, uh, unfortunately, late in that game against Georgia. They kind of took the ball out of his hands. Uh, he is only six feet tall, and I think that's the issue. If you want quarterback 6'2", or we talk about Josh Allen at 56.2%. If you want over 60, you don't take Josh Allen. If you want a 6'2", or a taller quarterback, you don't take Baker Mayfield. But I think you look at what Drew Brees has done, throwing through past lanes, not as many passes batted down. Uh, I think that's going to be the issue Baker Mayfield will have to work through. You think about you know, you call it Broadway Baker in New York with the Jets, you got to have that mentality, deal with that pressure and expectations. He's done that at Oklahoma, and I think he would be well suited there. Rosen, and that got that was the debate for me. Jack. When you debate, you take Rosen or Mayfield and you move the other quarterback down to Miami. I went that way, and another and few you weeks that may change, but right now Baker Mayfield, six to the Jets, I think would make sense. And you also have Kirk Cousins in the mix, and if he goes there, then Mayfield Field drops down just a bit. Go ahead, Todd. Kuiper, you definitely went with you definitely went with Baker there, so you could call him Broadway Baker all throughout today. <laughs> I know you. I'm onto your game. Todd, uh, what do you what do you think listen, about those he, Drew Brees comparisons? Gonna, fair. I think there's there's some. I think that some parts of their game. I think he went from Johnny Manziel on the field early in the season to after that Iowa State game, he really focused on staying in the pocket. It was a lot more Drew Brees like, Russell Wilson like in terms of his patience in the pocket, going through progressions, throwing accurately, anticipating throws, and then he can extend when you need that to happen. And I think that that's part of his, you know, that's part of his allure, if you will, that high in the draft. Now, you got to sort through. I, I think he loves the game, but I also think he loves what the game brings to him, too. I think that attention and just...